At this time, we'll have the presentation of colors by Robertson High School. The instructor is Tom Bell. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I ask that you remain standing for a moment of silence. Thank you. You may be seated. This time I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. Could I get a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The uh, superintendent's comments. Good evening, everyone. Our calendar waiver has been approved by the state for the 2019-2020 school year, and this will allow an earlier week start date than in the past few years, in addition to allow us to consider administering the high school semester exams prior to the Christmas break. And this is something that we've discussed for a number of years, and it's been quite a while since we've been able to do that. The model that has been submitted to you for approval tonight will include a starting date of Monday, August the 19th, and a final student date of Friday, May 29th, 2020. Over the next several weeks, all 53 schools in Buncombe County and Asheville City will be hosting visits from specialists to conduct a low-band radio repeater analysis. Uh, and Sheriff Duncan's nodding his head, so at least you understand, you might be the only one in the room, uh, to conduct a low-band radio repeater analysis of communication quality for law enforcement, emergency management, and highway patrol. And funding was also approved to support a subsequent equipment enhancement. And that will ensure clear communications between first responders in a potential crisis situation. And since, uh, um, since our first uh, edition of our safe school plan across the district, I think we've all realized how absolutely crucial that communication is and certainly the value of that first respond and those, the first response and the first responders. This Saturday, November 3rd, uh, between noon and, noon and 4 o'clock, a youth culinary competition will be held at AB Tech Community College. It will be held in the Magnolia Building, and several of our high school culinary teams will participate, along with celebrity chef mentors across Western North Carolina. There's a $10 admission, but that will allow you to sample all the dishes and support future professional chefs. And uh, Ms. Cheek, I think we've got several of those in the making if uh, based upon our last conversation. You are invited to our all-county high school honors chorus. That concert is next Tuesday, November 6th. It's at 7 p.m. at First Baptist Church of Asheville. And also for your calendar, November 26th at 6.30 p.m. at Brookstone Church in Weaverville, we will be, uh, they will be hosting the middle and high school band concert. So I want to invite uh, our board and the public to attend those events. And finally, I want to encourage everyone to vote if you have not already done so. Next Tuesday, November 6th, that will be an early dismissal day across the district. And uh, we encouraged our principals yesterday at our general principals meeting to encourage all their staff and faculty to uh, 
um, to do their civic uh, duty and, uh, and vote on that day. And that concludes my comments, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'll uh, recognize Stacia Harris for our good news. Good evening, Dr. Baldwin, Madam Chair, members of the board. Tonight, we want to start off our good news segment with David Thompson. He's the Director of Student Services. He's here to introduce us to our Counselors and Social Worker of the Year. Other one. Good evening, Dr. Baldwin, Madam Chair, board. And thank you for the opportunity to be the leader, if you want to call me that, of the wonderful group of counselors and social workers that we have. Often they're leading me, but uh, yeah, we've, we've brought a lot of good things and a lot of innovation and a lot of good ideas and training to the county over the last several years. And I'm proud of what we've done, but it's what they have done that's made the difference in our schools. It's what they do every day with our kids and with our schools and with our teachers and with our families that makes a difference every day. So tonight is the opportunity to recognize some of the ones that, they're, that the counselors themselves have nominated their colleagues and recognize their leadership among the group. And it's my privilege tonight to talk to you about our elementary counselor of the year, our middle school counselor of the year, our high school counselor of the year, and our school social worker of the year, and introduce you to some of the awesome things that they're doing in their building, as described by their colleagues and their teachers in their building and not by me. So our first uh, elementary school counselor of the year is Jamie Benfield. Jamie, if you will come down. Yes, a few things that were that her staff said about her at Weaverville Elementary. Jamie touches every student in some capacity at our school. The staff loves and trusts her with our precious students. When we're not sure how to help a student, Jamie is always there with such love and compassion. When students come back from being in, being with Ms. Benfield, you immediately notice a positive change in the child. Worry, fear, anger, and sadness seem to have lifted, and you see a new child equipped with strategies to help them. I always wonder, wow, what did she do? Mm -hmm. Ms. Benfield turned this child's day around, and what she does is so valuable. Ms. Benfield has heart and so much compassion. Her awards and accolades are impressive, but her character and daily actions shine as a true testament of her calling. That's amazing. Thank you, Jamie, so much. I won't walk away, I'll just go on to the next one and then I'll con congratulate all of them at the end. They've already done this once with me, so <laughs> they, they, we're, we're, we're practicing again. Our middle school counselor of the year is from Valley Springs Middle School, and it's Jennifer Anthony. And, you know, thank you. <laughs> Jennifer has been with the district for about 15 years. Um, She's an active member of the School Counselor Association and is a, has been active with, their, with the, the profession as well as, as Valley Springs Middle. She teaches impact students in the classroom on a regular basis, including bullies, social media awareness, and lessons geared to social emotional learning. She is a lifelong member of the chain gang at Valley Springs Middle School, which is a quite an accomplishment. Do you guys know what the chain gang is? The chain gang is moves the chain at the football games. Um, so she's on the chain gang and has, has shown dedication and school spirit above and beyond to, to, to the students at, at, uh, at Valley Springs. She organized and, and works on a, a, an outreach program with students for ambassadors where students connect with other students who are new to the building and orient them there. She's actively involved with transitions from one grade level to the next. But most of all, what her staff says is that Jennifer never requires praise or accolades and will not be happy that she's being nominated simply because she's perfectly content not to be in the spotlight. She has a tremendous part of a very successful school for 15 years, and as far as I know, never been recognized as a school counselor of the year. We want to change that tonight. So congratulations, Jennifer, on, on being nominated by and accepted by your peers on that one. And I don't think our high school counselor is here, but I will go ahead and recognize him. Oh, he's here. Okay, didn't see you, David. Sorry, David Craig, come on down. David Craig from Community High School. Um, this is probably one of my favorite comments made about a school counselor by anyone. 
school. David is Community High's Swiss Army knife. <laughs> I like that. And so many, he serves in so many different ways. I've never seen a counselor so multifaceted in a school setting. He not only seeks to support the student's emotional, social, and academic well-being, he supports teachers in the same way. David was one of the first to be, bring community resilience model to Buncombe County Schools and also paved the way for effective positive behavior supports and response to intervention systems at community high school. He's always advocating for improved support and assistance and most difficult counselor placement in the county so that he can help community find success with students that may otherwise be cast aside. Quite an accomplishment, David. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, We, we have kind of grown our social work program, uh, school social work program over the last several years. And uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to get to uh, recognize our school social worker of the year. And that is Allie Curley from Johnston Elementary School. <clears throat> Last year, um, Allie served two schools. She served... Uh, uh, but this year, thanks to some grant money that we got from the, from the state around uh, safe schools and the, the needs that are demonstrating in the, in the Johnston School District, Allie is now full-time helping devote truly trauma-informed care to kids at Johnston Elementary and making a huge difference in their lives there. So what her staff actually, that's my words, what her staff said about her is this. Allie was there for students in a way I have not seen from anyone else. She is able to listen and relate to parents of troubled children in a way that encourages trust and has been able to get services for students whose parents previously were so distrustful of the system and to allow them to, to be connected to services that they may need in the community. She is a constant in many students' lives and was able to help out more than one of my students this year in a profound way from helping to remove students from domestic violence situations to giving gas money for a family that needs to move. Allie is there and aims to help in any way possible. Thank you, Allie, for what you do for our kids. But, um, <laughs> we have certificates for each of these guys. That they, they're being recertificated <laughs> <laughs> because they've already been presented this once, but I really want to say from my heart, Thank you for all that you do for our kids. Appreciate it. Next item of good news, we're going to have Max Queen tell us a little bit more about an important partnership between Buncombe County Schools and the Inca Candler Fire Department. Thank you, Stacia. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone here this evening. Um, it's a distinct privilege to be here to speak to you about this matter tonight and to introduce a couple of guys that I want to do right off up front and get them up here to the front, uh, to the podium. Uh, but we have with us this evening the uh, uh, Chief Officers from Inca County Fire and Rescue Department, Chief Howard Bettingfield and Deputy Chief Randy King. And if they would join me up here, that would be fine if you'd like to come forward. Um, okay, as, as they're coming up, I just want to uh, share with you uh, what's been going on. Some of you that are frequent attenders, frequent flyers here at the board meeting, you will know that over the past several months, We've had an item on the agenda and we've worked around it. My colleagues here on, uh, on the board uh, will recall uh, a partnership opportunity that we would have with Inca County Fire Department uh, for a substation, a new substation in the Inca County community. And it would be located uh, adjacent to the Inca Intermediate School. 
uh, what that does is, is make, creates, in my, in my mind's eye at least, a win-win-win situation. Uh, certainly the schools are going to win because by putting that, putting that substation there, I have seven schools in any district. And that is going to decrease the response time to four of the seven, I'm sorry, five of the seven schools within the district, uh, making the, really the response times if an incident occurred to the intermediate school would be seconds. And uh, it would also greatly impact uh, Hominy Valley Elementary School, Sand Hill Venable Elementary School, uh, the uh, uh, Inca Middle School, uh, the, high school. the Inca High School. And uh, the only two that uh, probably would not have the immediate effect would be Candler Elementary and Pisgah, which are further away. But with that said, uh, it's a win for the schools. It's certainly a win for the fire department because in addition to decreasing the response time to the schools, it's also providing some additional services uh, to areas that were uh, out at the ed edge of the perimeter of, of, of an area of our district. And then finally, to those people that live in that, those areas, it certainly will be a relief uh, probably in insurance benefits on decreased homeowners insurance, that kind of thing. So with that said, I want to turn the podium over to Chief Bettingfield. And uh, again, uh, I want to thank you all for your, for your uh, cooperation and work toward this as an end. And we look forward to having you as a, as a neighbor. Absolutely. Thanks, thank sir. you. Good evening. And uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Baldwin, Madam Chair, for allowing us to come and visit with you this evening. Um, as Mr. Queen mentioned, um, this, this, is, this is a triple win for Inca District. Um, it's a win for education, it's a win for commerce, and it's a win for the Inca Fire Department and those who reside in the Inca Fire Department. For education, not only to the, uh, to the um, items that Mr. Queen mentioned, but our presence on that ground is going to create some degree of a deterrence to malicious and criminal activity. There's no doubt about that. We're going to be there watching out for you. For the commerce, I think uh, a lot of people know that, that we're growing in Inca, and that particular area that uh, we're going to be located in is going to, um, it's going to be a selling point for, for commerce coming in down in, in that area around uh, where the old Inca plant was, the clock tower. And we think that uh, we're going to be a, a benefit to them. For the fire department, um, and primarily for the residents of Inca Candler, um, right now uh, we're, we're in the, about the mid-70% range of having all of our district residents under what we call a five-mile umbrella. Um, having a station located at this precise location is going to bring that up to about 98%, maybe just a little bit more. And that's about as good as it's going to get. So we're going to help a lot of people with their insurance rates very soon. So with that said, I appreciate all the work that's been done behind, behind the scenes, Mr. Queen, um, and all of, all of the uh, Buncombe County School Board, as well as uh, the board for the Inca County Fire Department. And, uh, chaired by Mr. Terry Gentry. We appreciate his help in supporting this and all of this and all of our board. And our firefighters who have worked and done risk assessments for me that I've asked for. This has been four years in the making for me and probably maybe longer for some other folks. But uh, I've really worked hard for the last four years to try to make this happen. And uh, again, I want to thank you for making this a reality. It's it's this is a little piece of the puzzle, but it's, it's a significant piece of the puzzle to, to enhance the fire protection in the Inca Fire District. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you. somebody an evil look. <laughs>
Dr. Baldwin, don't sit down. (laughs) You're next. Uh, And for our final piece of good news tonight, Dr. Baldwin will will help us recognize Sheriff Van Duncan, a longtime supporter of public education. Even though he is from Yancey County. He's from Mitchell County. Is he from Mitchell County? Oh, that's even worse. Yeah. But we put up with him even though he's from Mitchell County. Okay. Van, I'm going to ask you to come down if, if you would for me. Um, I don't know if this is 100% good news uh, because the reason he's here is I don't think necessarily good news. Um, It may be good for him and Shanna's wife and the family. Um, But Van Duncan has been a great friend to Buncombe County Schools, our students, our children, our staff, all the community stakeholders, Van. For 12 years and three consecutive terms, uh, Van Duncan has been our sheriff. And we're so very proud of that, Van. In fact, the only regretful words that I'm gonna have to say is that uh, he's a graduate of Mitchell County High School instead of (laughs) Buncombe County High School. Uh, But we'll give him that because he was born and raised in Spruce Pine and he's a native of Western North Carolina, and I don't think Van has ever forgotten that. I think that's been a tremendous quality that you've brought to the service. Um, I read a message that was released from your department when you made the announcement regarding your retirement, and it said the work of this sheriff's office has been thoughtful, innovative, and holistic in its approach to enforcing the laws of the state of North Carolina without compromising the safety of the residents of Buncombe County. And I kept going back to thoughtful, innovative, and holistic, and that just seems like three words that we would find in a strategic plan for any school system in the state of North Carolina. But it so fits. Um, So many examples. Began back in the summer of 2007, Uh, And this was Van's vision, by the way. All of us know it. It was the on-track leadership development program that was set up for our kids, rising eighth and rising ninth graders, run by Sheriff Duncan and the school resource officers. They essentially worked with counselors, with teachers, with principals in our middle schools, and they hand-selected these individuals. And not only were were the individuals selected, there was a commitment that was made to the families. And I'll tell you, Van, um, I go to a lot of events, and the opportunity I've had to come to your summer on-track graduation program, um, man, you need a box of Kleenex, and and just just incredible what you've meant for for those children. Now, that's just one example. Uh, In 2013, you might remember as a reaction to Sandy Hook, I got a phone call from you. And um, your vision was to create a safe schools task force. You put that together. I think you were probably the first in the state that did that. They went through that committee and reviewed every safe school plan that's associated with Buncombe County. They compared it to best practices across the nation. And as a part of that, we surveyed and got responses from over 5,000 parents and staff in Buncombe County to really, really dig deep in terms of what what does our public and our community want to see for safer schools. So thank you for that. Um, He received national recognition from a program called COPS Teams, the Community Oriented Policing Services, national recognition. The Juvenile Diversion Program, um, that's at the heart of this man. Second chances for our kids. That's at the core of Van Duncan. And in March 2018, he received the Dogwood Award from the State Attorney General's Office. That's an incredibly prestigious award, Van. And it's based upon keeping North Carolinians safe, healthy, and happy in their communities. Um, And I'm going to leave maybe the best for last, and that's your leadership with our school resource officers. And you've heard me say this. and, and so many of us can say it as we talk to our peers across the state. We have 
hands down the best school resource officer program in the state of North Carolina and we're right up there in terms of the best in the nation Van and I point towards your leadership um, I know you're going to turn around and point to, uh, to a tremendous leader and that's Lieutenant Mike Ruby uh, but our school resource officers and what you've met for our schools and leading that program is um, is is just been incredible. So um, we just we're glad you're here. We thought we might have to actually send send officer out and handcuff you and bring you in because you're so busy. But thank you for being here. And I don't know if there's any true words to express what a tremendous friend and uh, you have been to us in this school system. So thank you, Van. been my honor to be your sheriff for the past 12 years. If I were running again, Dr. Baldwin would be my campaign chair and open every event I had. Wow. Uh, Tony, thank you so very much. In that 12 years, uh, one of the things that I am the most proud of is the relationship that we have with Buncombe County Schools, with the superintendent, with the board. Uh, it has been second to none, and it's allowed us to do those innovative things and be a part. And they've been very much a part and right there with us when we plan for everything from school safety to on track and, and all that support you gave us uh, kept on track successful and kept it moving and going forward, and I'm just so appreciative of that. And you're right, I, I can't stand up here and accept this without pointing to Mike Ruby. Uh, for his leadership. He was my patrol captain for a long period of time, and, and I learned a lot from his, his leadership, and uh, he has done a phenomenal job with a phenomenal group of SROs. And here's the thing, folks. I know both your candidates for sheriff. They both have a heart for our young people and for school safety. We're going to be good moving forward, and I know with this leadership here with this board, we absolutely are. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. We have no public comment tonight. We'll move to the action agenda. The uh, first item on the uh, action agenda is the 2018-19 uh, budget. Madam Chair, the curriculum feature, I think Excuse we ought to get to. <laughs> <laughs> we have no public comment tonight. We'll go to the curriculum feature. <laughs> but we do have a wonderful <laughs> curriculum feature, Madam Chair. Just move into the action in reality. <laughs> Let's stop for a, a little more good, good stuff before we sure. move on to the action agenda. Tonight we're going to feature our Career Academy at Irwin High School. This academy was the result of educators and stakeholders sitting around the table saying, what else can we do for dropout prevention at Irwin High School? It started out with the dream of better connection of workforce development with our, stu our students in the school building and outside of the school building. And tonight you're going to hear from a student. We have Robin Pass, who is one of our teachers, and then Christy Cheek's gonna head that off and then introduce the other guests. So welcome to Irwin's Career Academy and Christy Cheek.
Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Baldwin, and members of the board. In the Buncombe County School Strategic Plan, guiding principle number one, academic excellence, ask us to identify collective responsibility to increase academic growth and achievement in all students. So initially, all we're doing is building that Buncombe graduate. In guiding principle number four, family and community engagement, we look at community partnerships and provide enhanced opportunities for our students. So tonight, we tie all that together in Career Academy at Irwin High School, and many of you all have participated in that as well. And tonight, we're gonna hear from these amazing students and Robin Pass, the graduation advocate, and they're gonna tell you about the many successes and partners that this program brings. So Irwin High School, it's your time to shine. Let's see if I can pull this up. All right. Madam Chair, Dr. Baldwin, board members, um, thank you so much for listening tonight. I'm really excited to share something that I feel so privileged to be a part of um, and to share with you this program that I think is doing such awesome things. Um, thank you for listening. Um, in 2008, when the Career Academy was started under the vision and direction of Ms. Christy Cheek and others at the table, um, it, you know, it was meant to be part of the graduation initiative, and I think if we look 10 plus years down the road where we are now, I feel like it really embodies what career and technical education is all about, about learning outside just the four walls and making education come alive in ways that maybe aren't in the traditional classroom. Um, as our four-year program has grown, we continue to have about 120 students each year. Um, that begins in the eighth grade with teacher recommendations and interview and application process that you guys probably both remember going through when you did your um, I think one of the beauty, beauty, beautiful pieces of Career Academy is that there really is no one type of student. Um, when we look for students in Career Academy, we're looking for maybe that quiet kid in the back, maybe the kid who has everything to say in the front, uh, maybe the kid who's not had a great school experience but could use some convincing, and maybe the kid who's in all AP classes but has struggles at home that make it really hard for them to be successful and to show up each day. Um, I think the real gauge of what we're doing, if you look at our graduation rate, we're at about 97, and that actually might be a little low um, in my four years doing it. Um, I think that speaks for itself. Our kids graduate. I think the program works, and I think that the support and the experiences are, are lending themselves to that grad graduation rate. Um, ultimately, I think what Career Academy has done is it opens doors, and I think it expands opportunities for kids, hopefully to make a maybe not okay experience and make it better, or make a really okay experience and make it great for our Career Academy kids. Um, typically in the Career Academy program, it starts with the four years that we build um, with their freshman year, um, starting in a career management program. Um, they follow a hospitality and tourism cluster, which obviously in this region sort of makes sense for what we have and what we have to offer. Um, one really cool part about that is since we really invest a lot in our freshman class, we have the only year-long class at Irwin High School. So we take that career management class and we use the career management elements, but we also build in leadership and self-reflection and some of those skills that we know the kids are gonna need. Um, and we start that from day one. Um, one of the ways we build those skills and build knowledge with our students is through guest speakers. Who better to come and tell kids about what career opportunities are out there than the experts themselves? As you can see up here, all sorts of um, career aspects, career uh, across the spectrum from healthcare to law enforcement, uh, a vet tech who shows eyeballs to the kids, whatever it takes to get guest speakers in, and also college representatives. Um, one I wanted to feature just actually happened recently this year. I'm always looking for new partnerships, and through our sports and entertainment marketing class that our sophomores take, I decided it would be a great idea if we could do something with entertainment. So I reached out to Diana Wortham Theater, asked if they'd be interested in partnering. Sure enough, they got right back to me. Derek McIntyre, their community engagement director, said he would be glad to come in and speak with the kids about what he's done. It's been his life's work. And if you look at the middle slide there, you'll see he actually came and spoke with the students about 
about his background and all those careers and jobs that are list linked to the entertainment field, things I wouldn't have even thought of other than just being on the stage. Um, and with that, we actually went and saw a program at the Diana Wortham Theater this week. Um, the Soul Street Dance Troupe was there, and not only did the kids get wowed with a lesson in hip hop, but um, we also got to take a backstage tour and notice things like the lighting and the stage director. We, I mean, all sorts of things that maybe you wouldn't have thought of that are off the beaten path, which is sort of what we're all about. With that, those field experiences, those trips that we go on, we have gone all over the place in the past few years. Uh, the Health and Human Services Department, we went and took a tour there last year. Uh, Starbucks has been a partner with us for our marketing class. Um, we've been to with the Women's Power Up Conference. We've been to all sorts of advanced manufacturing, of course, Grove Park and Biltmore, um, all places that we've, we've opened the doors for the kids. Another feature, actually, just recently, I partnered with our amazing foods teacher at Irwin, who had uh, shared with me an experience that they were going to the AB Tech um, Expo, Culinary Expo, um, that, that AB Tech does to kind of get a taste for what they have to offer. But we decided to take it a step further. We partnered, and I uh, used my contacts at the Grove Park to um, set up a visit for our kids. We spoke with both executive chefs of both wings of the Grove Park. So the kids got to hear firsthand from some really amazing culinary legends, you know, experts, like I think they said celebrities, um, in our region about their journey and sort of what, what path took them there and got to hear the advice firsthand about what it might take to get there. Um, as you can see, the list, that's kind of an overview of some of the companies we've worked with, our partnerships in the past um, four years that I've been here. And I'll say this, to speak volumes for our business community, I don't think I've ever been turned down when I've reached out for a partnership. I think every single business has been really excited about partnering with us and supporting our kids and really excited about the Career Academy program and what we're doing. Um, we don't just do career readiness, we also do college readiness, it's what we're all about. So we uh, start every year with my freshmen, the first field trip we take is to AB Tech to kind of get a taste for what's out there. Obviously, they're doing it in a way that explores lots of different fields, so the kids get a taste for it. We also started to include uh, college visits to Western, Mars Hills, Mars, Mars Hill, we've had a speaker from King's College, and also several technical institutes um, that have come to speak to the kids. We're about building skills, you know, sort of a list of the, the big picture of what we're trying to do in that career management class from day one. Um, but we know from what businesses have said that soft skills matter. Um, with that, another partnership we've really developed over the past four years is with Silverline Plastics. Mr. Brian Dover has just been an amazing advocate and resource for our kids. He um, not only hosts us on a tour of the, the, the factory, but he comes in each year when we do our resume and interview skills and does a hands-on experience with the kids, what are we looking for as human resources, what, are, what does it mean to have a really good interview, how to shake a hand and look somebody in the eye and the importance of that. So those soft skills that we know really matter for kids starting out. And also service learning with the soft skills, we feel like it's important for kids to give back, to be collaborators, to be part of the community. Uh, we have done for the past several years a volunteer um, project with the Saint, or the Evelyn St. Nicholas project. The kids go and help with that. We go to Johnston and Reed for um, Read Across America Week, Teacher Service Night. We've done several of those projects as well. Um, big piece also being academic support. How do we elevate our experience for our kids in these four years? Um, they make that big four-year plan their freshman year when senior year seems so far away and then it happens a whole lot faster than they think. Um, personalized scheduling, lots of parent and teacher and contact, student contact. I mean, one thing I'm really excited about is that we also recognizing that math has just been a really big struggle for our kids. Um, I reached out to our math teachers and we started a tutoring program after school one or two days a week where we have math teachers that will sit down and work either individually or in small groups so kids can ask some of those tough questions that maybe they wouldn't ask in the regular classroom. Um, also with the, the freshmen and building those connections, it starts before school starts. In middle school when I taught there, they had the summer bridge program to build connections and we started a summer bridge program for my incoming freshmen, a two day program and we test our medal at the Adventure Center and also get a chance to explore the campus without the other 1200 kids that attend. And sort of the apex, I think the pinnacle of what we do is the hospitality camp that many of you have been involved with. Um, we hire 20 students in my program each summer um, via application and interview process, just like they would if they were going to another job. And they get a paid week-long internship experience. Um, 
that I think just is is uh, invaluable. It's, it's it's a real look at what having a job would be. It gets them in the door other places. And one thing I'm really excited about this year is that we partnered with Goodwill Industries and we took a two-day course in a guest services gold star certification. And I'm proud to say that 20 out of our 20 kids were all certified and are now gold star guest service professionals. So something we're really excited about. Um, what's that? Yeah, it's very exciting. I think they're excited too. So. Um, but I wanted to give a chance to kind of hear from the experts themselves in the Career Academy program. Um, and I'm so proud that these two kiddos are here tonight, stepping a little bit out of their comfort zone to come and do this with me. I think it speaks volume about them and hopefully their commitment too to the program. So I'll start with our <coughs> current senior and soon to be graduate, David Missenheimer. All right, so Career Academy has like <coughs> helped me a lot because it's given me opportunities to get out of school tutoring and in class tutoring and like learn about a bunch of like stuff like that maybe kids my, my age might not know about. And having Miss Pass there and Miss Stevens, they're like always on my back about my grades. Like always. And it's annoying sometimes. It's like <laughs> get off my back, you know? But but if I don't have a good grade, they're gonna get on my back for that. And that's just the whole thing about Career Academy. Aylin Valdez, she was a uh, Career Academy for all four years, also did our hospitality camp all four years that she was a part of it. Hey guys. So I graduated, you know, I was in this program for four years and now I attend AB Tech. And I can promise you with everything that I have learned in these four years, I take with me every day to my AB Tech classes and just their help. Like they pushed me to be who I am right now. And I know how to do an interview. I know how to do a resume. I know how to have a great first impression with somebody and that's with all their help. And I'm really proud, and I miss them so much, but I know that they're doing what they did with me, with these new freshmen, their sophomores, their seniors, and their juniors. So I'm very thankful, and I thank you guys for helping us have that. And I definitely know I would not be who I am if I did not have them on my back. And I really was annoying, but you know what? I am so proud, and I did a great job, and they did awesome with me. So... <laughs> much. I really do feel like it, it is an honor and a blessing to be a part of the program. And when people ask me about what I do, I've, I feel like I, I've been given a gift. And so many people say about Career Academy that, you know, they wish they had this kind of program when they were in school. So thank you all for making it happen. And thank you for listening tonight. I appreciate it. You all have questions? Ask away. <laughs> <laughs> She's not shy. Not She's not there. shy. <laughs> I, I, I've got a little anecdotal story. Um, that really made me proud about two weeks ago, I called my high school basketball coach who moved on and coached in college and retired from the University of North Alabama in Florence, Alabama. And we were talking about a lot of stuff and he was asking about school board and things going on in Buncombe County Schools and he was talking about some problems they're having there and what he was describing was Career Academy and the problems they were having in the schools in Alabama were to do these types of classes, they put kids on six high schools on a bus and take them to a central location for one hour a day. And he said they get about 40 minutes because the bus will get caught in traffic and things happen and then getting them back to their school to take one class. And I was so proud of Buncombe County Schools because of what Ms. Cheek and what the school system has done long before I ever got on this board and CTE and the things that go on and the opportunities we provide in a lot of different ways in a lot of our high schools, in-house, on campus, and the programs that are there, that I just assumed we were probably one of like everybody else is doing. And it, it's, it's one school system in one state, but it was one phone conversation that really made me proud of what this board's done and what the people do on a daily basis in the school. So thank you for that. Amazing. <laughs> she is. She's amazing. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you all. Yeah. Do you want to get a picture with them? I would love to. Yes. As long as I don't have standby Sparty. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> Go green. Can we go in the middle? 
Yeah, go to the Maui Island. I mean, it's your stage. You go, girl. I think it's also important to know that you all add local funds to the Career Academy as well as yearly we apply for about a $94,000 grant from, AB, uh, from county commissioners. So that funding is crucial to the continuation of the Career Academy. Madam Chair, can I just, can I take the liberty to ask for just a few minutes to recognize an individual? I believe that would be appropriate. Uh, we recognized Sheriff Duncan on his decision to retire. Um, certainly had some very mixed emotions saying that. And I've got mixed emotions saying what I'm gonna say now. And that is, uh, even though uh, we have, um, another formal opportunity to, uh, to roast, I mean to recognize Mrs. Christy Cheek. Um, I'm not going to let this opportunity uh, go by on, our, on her last board meeting not to recognize her uh, informally. Um, you know, I think of two words for Christy. Um, I may have thought of a few more along the way, but... <laughs> <laughs> The first is champion. There is no greater champion in the state of North Carolina for career tech education. And we're not talking about a professional that's recognizing the, just the state. She's recognized regionally. She's recognized nationally for being a champion. Um, career tech education has now entered into an area where it is just as important is what traditionally we called our core, um, which is our language arts, our social studies, our science and math. We gotta add career tech education because let me tell you, it is the best example we have in our curriculum of how we integrate all four of them. And, and, uh, and Christy has been such a champion for that. And the other, uh, the other way I describe Christy regarding this school system as ambassador. And I see her in so many areas outside of Buncombe County that few people in this room have an opportunity to see her. Her reputation among advanced manufacturers, among the Asheville Chamber of Commerce, among professional organizations tied into business and core business in Western North Carolina, her reputation is spotless, and what she means and has meant for Buncombe County Schools with that reputation and that ability to be such an incredible ambassador for our school system is second to none. So, uh, Christy, like I say, the next time I talk about you, I'm going to really roast you good, I promise. But uh, for tonight, thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you in this school system. We're going to miss you uh, over the next six months, and then uh, we will see you on a, a very we won't frequent miss basis. You anymore. <laughs> um, but we do wish you the very best, and, and I just want to give this board an opportunity tonight to uh, to recognize what you've meant for our school system. Christy's an energizer bunny. If that was the two words I thought Dr. Baldwin was going to use. <laughs> the Energizer Bunny. Energizer Bunny. I, that's exactly where I thought he was going with the two words. And if you don't rev it up and get in line with her, she leaves you standing behind. And that's true in her personal life as well as in her professional life. And, uh, and the people that she's hired better hop to it and do it 
and do it right, Miss Energizer Bunny. You're just not pink. <laughs> okay. All right. Anybody else have something they'd like to say? Just thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Cheek. Are you, uh, are you, oh, no, it's me. Okay, and to get my agenda correct, at this time we're moving on to the action agenda. And we're, um, the first item is the adoption of the 1819 budget. And I would, um, Ms. Frisbee's turn. I love it when she just gets up and comes on down. And um, I would uh, ask if the board has questions for Ms. Frisbee. Of course we do. Of course we do. Are you going first? Uh, I can or? Sure, I go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm trying to find. Mine are just uh, sort of little questions as I was going through um, that I want to make sure that I understand. Um, so if it's okay, I'll refer to certain page numbers. Absolutely. Um, so in the section about central office administration, uh, page 210, 211, it looks like we are not budgeting for some pretty significant positions. So do those positions show up somewhere else? So um, I think you're re this refers to fund one and fund two. If you're seeing zeros in fund one, they're in fund two. Okay. So that, that just means they're showing up in a different part yes, of the... Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Thank you. I figured. Um, now going on to PRC 034, which is the AIG program. Whereas most parts of this budget are staying flat Give or declining. Yes, yes, that's page 2-59. Whereas most parts of the budget are declining or staying mostly flat, we are when I look at the total paid by all funds for the AIG program, it's jumping way up. And I'm just wondering if you can explain, does that have to do with the flexibility yes, being removed that's on the yes. previous page? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we lost our flexibility in this PRC for 2018-19. Okay. So that's why there's so lots of funds, differences. again, from somewhere else in the budget are coming here. It's yes, not that all of a sudden we're paying a whole lot more for the AIG no. program than we have in the past. That's okay. correct. Um, now I'm over to, in tab four, uh, PRC 026, page 4-5. This is about McKinney-Vento. Um, I know this is an area particularly near and dear to our chair's heart. Yes. And it looks like our budget is going through the floor for this one. Um, and is that the case, or will there be other funds that we can bring in to help with our homeless population? There are other funds that support this. Okay. We've just received a decline in this PRC, but they've been shifted to another one. Okay. Um, and then finally, also under tab four, uh, four dash 16, which is CTE capacity building. It looks like from the text that there will be funds for this, but under 1819, it's blacked out. That's because we have not received notification of receipt of those yet. Gotcha. So then we'll do a They usually come in later than the okay. normal federal projects. Okay. Those were my questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Bryant. So to kind of piggyback on, on some of that, can you give us kind of a um, synopsis maybe of the last three years, five years, um, um, just from an over from a thirty thousand foot level of, of flexibility 
um, that it sounds like we've lost some flexibility in terms of how funds can be used and not used, and maybe a little historical look at why it was important and why, what good you were able to do if, in being able to have some flexibility and how that impacts us losing that flexibility. Okay, sure. Um, so um, in the past, we have had the ability through ABC transfers to transfer money from certain state allotments and utilize position allotments because the state guarantees salaries on position allotments. So we were able to put higher funded people in the AIG program, um, EC program and things like that in the state allotments and then use those funds for lower paid people. Each year as over the past five years, we have lost that flexibility. So right now in fiscal year 1819, the only PRC that we can move is um, PRC 24. So um, each year, the flexibility tightens up with the state. So that, that in reality, cost us more money. So the Which then cost them more money, too. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So it, it was helpful to be able to move the high-paid people in those positions, but as time goes on, we're not able to do that anymore. And, and what that did, basically, in essence, was for... In this case, for Buncombe County Schools, you stretch the dollars further. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're able to provide mm -hmm. more opportunities in a lot of different areas for more kids. That is correct. Okay, and we are have lost and are lo and or are losing all of that flexibility. Or I know we've lost most of it. We've lost most of it. There are still a couple of state PRCs that we have the ability to do that with. But as time goes on, we expect that flexibility to end as well. Okay. And this is set by the state. Yeah. So it's coming out of Raleigh. Yes, sir. Okay. And then the, the, the big question I had, of course, in terms of where we're going and, and what we're doing tonight with, with uh, uh, the initial three pages of the budget, but then getting to page six, and you and I had had a brief discussion by email about this just in getting to page six of tab one. We were looking at, in the initial budget resolution of a stabilization funds of 4.8 million. Then on page six, that number is 5.548 million. So there's an additional 740 or so thousand that's being used. Right. Where is that money? What, did that impact any programming people or anything? How did, we, how did so that come to be? So of that 5.5 million appropriated uh, out of fund balance, $742,158 represents assigned fund balance. The 4.8 is the stabilization fund balance. And what does assigned fund balance mean? That is money that we assign for subsequent year's expenditures, and that was fund balance left over from our 1718 budget in the assigned category. Okay, and that was all that was left from that assigned category to have the ability to be able to carry forward? Yes, sir. Okay. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Okay. Any other board member have questions? All right, then I would entertain a motion to approve this 2018-19 um, budget. I move that we approve the budget, Madam Chair. Thank you. Could I get a second? I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Frisbee. Uh, second item on the agenda is the approval of the beginning teacher support plan. Um, we all right over there? So that's Ms. Swanger. You have a plan that Dr. Sherry Boone initiates through working with our regional consultant to ensure that we are supporting our newest teachers for their first three years. Uh, very syst syst uh, systematic plan that principals are aware of, our BTs are aware of, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. This is not new, correct? Not new. It, how Little much, new format. Um, how much, because I didn't have the previous, how much is is different. A lot of what I read through in reading this, in, in the anecdotal things I hear about what goes on, seem to be very similar to what's been done in the past. Is it that or is there a lot of difference? The, well, we try to simplify it and put everything in one place for um, principal's reference, for BT's reference. 
Uh, the things that we're doing differently this year, we're doing more district-based optional PD for beginning teachers to choose from. We still have the orientation that many of you have popped in on in early or right before school starts. Right. We still have principals assigned that peer mentor in the building. So all of those things are the same. What is different, we had three retirees who worked solely with beginning teachers. And legislative changes came about last year that said we had to use um, current teaching professionals to mentor our teachers. So in last year's plan, we had three district employees who worked part-time and visited all of our BTs in addition to their school-assigned peer mentor. This year, we only have Dr. Boone and Beverly Benfield working part-time to supervise and answer questions and provide that PD in collaboration with curriculum. Which is a big loss. It is a loss. It certainly is. It, it shows the, the critical importance of having those peer mentors inside the school building very systematically working with our BTs. And that's, what, that's the structure from which we're operating this year. So this is a plan. How does it relate to policy? So if there's some part of this that doesn't get followed with a beginning teacher or something, it, it, then are we going against policy? How does this... How do there's a regional lead ag agent that works in Western North Carolina through the Department of Public Instruction who does audits mm -hmm. and brings a team in and reviews our portfolios. They look to see that teachers have been assigned their mentor. They look to see if principals have completed the evaluation process correctly. And then if there are findings, then we correct those and submit an, another plan. Um, she has been with Dr. Boone. She's seen this plan. It, it certainly follows what North Carolina is advising. Mm -hmm. Other questions from board members? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you. Second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next item on the action agenda is the pool replacement project. We are going to uh, potentially approve um, a change order. This is um, Mr. Fearley. And um, do any of you have questions for Mr. Fearley at this time? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve. One, one point uh, okay. I did want to uh, make mention of. Our attorney, our attorney presented a uh, document uh, in closed session concerning liquidated damages, and it is not consistent with this. So the, what we presented in closed session precedes this uh, uh, now. Correct, Mr. Queen. What the, the proposal, the change order request proposal from the contractor that was included in the board packet was just incorrect in regards to about no liquidated damages. Yes, sir. So we are not waiving liquidated damages um, by approving the change order. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, then at this time, um, I would entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Now we go to the infamous school calendar, and that's Ms. Swanger. And my co-chair, Ms. Lopez. <laughs> I get the pleasure of doing this every year. We're getting pretty good at it. Board members, you received a draft and then an, an, a, a corrected draft later this, after board materials went out because we had our last calendar committee meeting on Monday. So that's why there were two drafts for your review. Uh, the 1920 calendar that we are presenting to you this evening involved over 30 committee members from educators, principals, teachers, um, auxiliary services, data through power school, curriculum, athletics. 
It, it is a large committee, and of course, students and parents. Miss Churchill's daughter, Maddie, was one of our student representatives, and then we had another young man from uh, Reynolds High School. We, we rotate the members on the calendar committee each year so that we feel like that we have a, a balanced perspective of bringing all viewpoints to the table. But we had four committee meetings and had homework in between, and this is where we are. Um, First and foremost, we missed enough snow over the last uh, two years that we now qualify for a weather waiver. We had one in years past. We lost it because we had mild winters, and we have it back. So you'll see that we qualified for the waiver because eight or more days, and those are whole days. Those aren't early dismissals or late starts, but eight or more days were missed due to inclement weather in four of the last 10 years. So um, Paula Garland and Dr. Uh, Joe Huff's office keeps great records for us, so we, we track that and we report that to the state each year. Uh, with the waiver, we can start one week earlier, and we have uh, made the announcement through communications last week that parents should be ready that we are recommending to start just a little bit earlier. And, and we, are, we are moving to, I think, Dr. Baldwin, you mentioned it before, but we, the decision has been made to do everything we can to finish first semester prior to the Christmas break, to have first semester exams and all that work done Correct. prior to break. We had multiple drafts of a calendar. We had a traditional calendar, even starting with the waiver and starting a week early. And then we had a draft calendar that, in, that involved looking at finishing exams before the Christmas winter holiday break. And um, we are operating under the 1,025 hours instead of 185 school days on the draft that you received. It's important to note that we have been operating off of 1,025 hours, but it's also important to note that we far exceed 1,025 hours. We feel very, very strongly that students need more time, not less time, to complete the work. And we also have to have a good buffer because we don't know how many early dismissals or late starts we will have to have during the winter season. So. When we plan for a calendar, we track the hours and we watch very, very closely in those projections to make sure that we feel like our teachers have the time that they need to accomplish the task. So as Mr. Bryant mentioned, we did have the um, discussion about what would happen if we finish before winter holidays. Can we get exams in? And we had lots of debates, lots of discussion. We uh, collected lots of feedback because it was very important to note that if we do this, there are some trade-offs. And because the calendar is a K-12 calendar, we needed everyone on that committee to have their voice represented and to be okay with moving forward. Because having exams for, before Christmas really impacts high school and middle school semester-long courses more than anyone else. So Cynthia is going to share the survey results so you can have a perspective of the stakeholders. So the committee, in order to feel comfortable about its decision, asked us to put together a survey to ask the teachers. So we sent a survey to over 2,000 licensed employees and asked them just a few questions. Uh, we had two options, one starting school early, like the one you have starting on August 19th, and the other calendar uh, started later. I believe it was August 21st, and it would, we would not finish the first semester with, before the winter holidays. So uh, what we uh, received back from our teachers, we were pleased that we had um, about 1,350 responses from our 2,000 licensed educators. 56% you see here voted for exams before the winter break. Now this is all levels of teachers and we ask teachers to tell us where you teach, what grade level. Uh, so 56% said yes, let's do exams before the winter break. And then our next question was, um, if, for, in order to accomplish this, we had to add minutes 
to the day. Are you in favor of that? And I'd say pretty overwhelmingly, teachers said no, we're not in favor of that if it's going to require adding minutes to uh, the day. And then we um, targeted just our high school teachers because the other important question that the uh, committee had was, for high school teachers, if we have an 84-day semester, first semester, can you finish your standards? Are you able to teach your course content during that time period? And we had 70% of the high, just the high school teachers who said yes. So, um, so we took this back to our committee. The majority, 56% of, of all educators, um, would like to see the exams um, and would like to finish the first semester before the holiday break. Um, 70, we also isolated just the high school educators who favored completing uh, the exams before the winter break, and that also was 70%. And then the majority said, do not add minutes to our day in order to do this. So you're, if you're able to do it without the minutes, we are in favor of it. Uh, so the committee rec recommended then we will have an 84-day instructional um, calendar first semester, and you can see from the calendar that you have, we will have one mid-semester teacher work day and two early dismissal days. Second semester will be 96 instructional days with two semester teacher work days and five early dismissal days. We'll start school on August the 19th, um, and the last day of school is May the 20, yes, May the 29th. My yes. birthday, just so you know. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> so we will work really hard to finish school by May the 29th with that in mind. Very good. Do you have any questions for us? I have a couple of questions. Did you consider surveying parents? Why, why did you only survey teachers? Um, we did consider that. Do you want to take that one, Ms. Wonger? The parents on the committee all felt strongly about exams before the holidays. Uh, we heard comments such as, it would be nice for our kids to not have to worry about projects or studying over the winter break. <coughs> we felt like um, <coughs> that was overwhelmingly what we were hearing from our committee members <coughs> who were parents. So we felt like this was more of a curriculum decision to see can we cover our standards in that period of time? And what do we have to do as a curriculum team to work on our pacing to ensure that we cover those? Mm -hmm. uh, now the caveat in the room is what if we have some large storm in December? Uh, if, if we can meet this request, we certainly, that's our hope and we'll work towards. But if we get through mid-December and um, we have not completed our standards, then we will have to have exams after the winter break. It, it may be a moving target no matter what. Mm -hmm. And when was the last <laughs> time we were able to have exams before winter break, do you know? It was before the calendar uh, law went into place, so 2005. 2007. Did you say 2005? I think yeah. that's right. We yeah. looked at that in the committee, and it mm -hmm. was in the mid-2000s. Mm -hmm. And we did have exams before Christmas most years. There were years where it snowed that last week, and we had two exams before Christmas, and students had two exams when they returned. So we have seen it in both conditions. One other question I had. So one of the changes between the version we first saw and then the second version we got was about October 31st. And I heard several people being glad that yesterday was an early release. Um, being Halloween. And so I'm just wondering why that got switched and is no longer early release? We, uh, the discussion was where in, this, in that nine weeks do teachers need time to work on mid-semester grades or mid-nine-week grades? Mm -hmm. And so that was the committee's determination. Uh, the, the other change was teachers said because we are not having the amount of early dismissals during first semester to protect those hours of instruction, teachers felt strongly, could we not have the blue PLC days during fall semester? We'll still do PLCs, they're still a part of our schedule, but those early dismissals 
geared for PLCs will not occur fall semester because teachers felt strongly that they needed more time in their classrooms for parent-teacher conferences, reviewing the data, and instructional planning. And so for the public who may not know what PLCs are, that's professional, professional learning, learning communities. communities. Time for teachers to work together. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions from board members? Well, I think that answered my question because I was going to just ask what um, was going to take place on the four early dismissals that are, I guess, yellowish orange. But you're saying that's actually that's for time for teachers to either right. do parent teacher conferences, work in their classrooms, work on assessments, work on planning. It means I don't pull them out into a workshop. Yeah. They're protected from me and their principals. <laughs> they get to work in their classrooms. Well, well, I'm sure they appreciate that very much. And, and we continue to hear, and one parent was quite vocal on our team, please, how do we give teachers more time? Other questions? I, I had a one, maybe for Dr. Ballin or Ms. Swan, I'm not sure, but the reality, when we've had winter issues, second semester, I mean, it would seem to me that did you look at the number of days that we're getting in second semester when we've had winter? I, I would think the 84, 85 it's not is probably that what it's veteran close. teachers have had to deal with Absolutely. in a second semester to get ready for final exams at the end we of the year. We have had different days in each semester for many, many years. Yeah. And I think our teachers appreciate knowing now to plan and ensure right. pacing follows that. And. I probably have asked this before, and you probably answered it, but on June the 5th and the 8th are two AVL days. What is an AVL day? Asheville. We're in Asheville, that's right. The that's law what I thought says, when I saw it. The law says that as part of the requirements that we have two days uh, in which teachers may take annual leave. Two, they're optional teacher work days, basically, but teachers, we cannot schedule anything on those days, and teachers are able to take their annual leave. So we typically put them at the very end of the calendar, but just to show that we comply with the law. Okay. It is confusing. I think that was it, because I was going to ask about the PLCs, and you've covered that. Well, that's all I had, Madam Chair. All right. Anyone else? Then I'm looking for a motion to approve the 2019-2020 calendar. So moved. Thank you. A second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We move, mm, thank you. We need to move now to the consent agenda. Uh, on the consent agenda are the minutes for October 4 regular meeting, the personnel report, Advisory Council requests to add a member, BCS Early and Middle College Change of Bank, uh, Clyde A. Irwin's Middle School Use of Capital Outlay Allotment, and Valley Springs Middle School Use of Capital Outlay Allotment. I uh, would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you. Could I get a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have um, on our information agenda, the supplemental information for the 1819 budget, notification of <coughs> informal construction and repair contracts and change orders, policy 5030R, and that's the community use of facilities and a copy of the facilities use form. And a policy for first reading is policy 5025, the prohibition of drugs and alcohol. And um, our next meeting, uh, some or all of us are going to attend the annual uh, school boards <coughs> conference in Greensboro, November 12th through the 14th. And our board meeting will be December the 6th. It is not scary that we're that close to December. And uh, it will be at 6.30 here in the Minotorium. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. You all want to stay here all night? So moved. <laughs> So moved. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, you got that